Good morning. I'm Berks County Commissioner Christian Leinbach, and I want to welcome you to our Board of Commissioners meeting for July the 30th of 2020. I do want to remind everyone there are two opportunities for public comment. The first will uh, be near the beginning of the meeting, and that is public comment on specific agenda items. If you want to make a public comment, if you're on Microsoft Teams, you can do it through the Q&A function. If you're watching on Facebook Live or on YouTube Live, you can make that comment uh, through their uh, comment tool. Uh, when you make a comment, we must have your name and the municipality in which you reside. So I wanna encourage you, if you have comments, uh, please go ahead and uh, take advantage of that opportunity now. We're going to begin this morning uh, with a moment of sil silence followed by a pledge to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any additions or corrections for the July 23rd, 2020 commissioner meeting minutes, the July 23rd, 2020 phase three recovery and beyond meeting minutes and the July 28th, 2020 operation meeting minutes. Hearing none, the minutes will stand approved as presented. I do wanna take note we did hold two executive sessions, one on July 23rd, dealing with personnel and union negotiations, and again on July the 28th, also personnel and union negotiations. Uh, Mary Buer, do we have any public comment on specific agenda items? We do not. Okay, thank you very much. I, We're gonna move. I actually think you do. You have one there at the bottom. All the way at the bottom? Second to last. Thank you. Let's look down here. Okay. Okay, uh, regarding the furloughs, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, okay. This is from Jess Royer, Spring Township, uh, agenda item 263.2020 regarding furloughs and layoffs. Public service isn't something people do to get rich. Working for local government is opportunity to be part of your community, to be proud of your community and to know that you are valued. As commissioners, you have at times praised the caliber and dedication of county workers. And now's the time to stand by those very individuals and their families. I don't know who in particular is driving force behind the proposed furloughs and layoffs but I would encourage all of you to vote against this agenda item in order to provide county workers with the occupational stability that they sought when they took employment with the county. We will move uh, to the agenda. Item one, authorizing under that budget department, adopt a resolution authorizing 2020 budget transfers in the amount of $259,217 and 2020 appropriations in the amount of $39,610 per listing dated July 27th of 2020. Uh, we have several items listed under human resources. Item one, authorize the appointment of Michael Schoen to assistant district attorney one in the district attorney's office. Item two, authorize stipend in the amount of $70.50 per pay period for Amy Rothermel, Law Clerk One Court Administration. 
There are a number of items listed under purchasing. Item A, adopt a resolution authorizing the award and director of contracts and procurement to execute as a result of an invitation to bid uh, a one-year contract for recycling services to be utilized by the Berksheim and the County Recycling Center as follows. <clears throat> the Waste Industries of Pennsylvania out of Newmanstown total estimated annual expenditure is $33,830. Item B, adopt a resolution authorizing the award and the Director of Contracts and Procurement to execute as a result of an invitation to bid 11 contracts for food provisions for the jail system, Berks County Residential Center, and the Berksheim for a one-year period as follows. National Food Group uh, out of Novi, uh, Michigan, total estimated annual expenditure $48,760.60. Bimbo Foods USA out of Albany, New York, Total estimated annual expenditure $158,219.88. Synco Logistics out of Morristown, New Jersey. Total estimated annual, annual expenditure of $27,873.87. The Reading Coffee Company, Birdsboro, PA. Total estimated annual expenditure $42,611 and 65 cents. Imperial Beverage Systems out of Harrisburg, PA. Total estimated annual expenditure, $3,442.57. Clover Farms Dairy Company out of Reading, PA. Total estimated annual expenditure, $16,214.91. Foods Galore out of Pensacola, New Jersey. Total estimated annual expenditure $154,446.07. Ace Endico Corporation out of Brewster, New Jersey. Total estimated annual expenditure $532,053.42. Durstein Food Service out of Sellersville, PA. Total estimated annual expenditure $81,869.81. Good Source Solution out of Carl Carlsbad, California. Total estimated annual expenditure $17,924.11. And Metropolitan Foods out of Clifton, New Jersey. Total estimated annual expenditure $156,211 and 53 cents. There are a number of items listed under the commissioners. Item A, adopt a resolution authorizing execution of the lease extension agreement between Mark and Pam Hathaway, Reading, PA for property located at 136 North 8th Street in Reading for the purposes of accomplishing Title 4B Child and Family Services Improvement and Innovation Act goals to improve the quality of monthly caseworker visits with children who are in foster care with an emphasis on improving caseworker decision making related to child safety, permanency and well being. The lease is for a one year term beginning August the 13th of 2020 and ending August the 14th of 2021 at the rental amount of $21,916 for the one year term. <clears throat> Item B, adopt a resolution authorizing execution of the independent contractor agreement between the County of Berks and Katie E. Amorel, Reading, PA, to provide training assistance and consultation services to the Berks County Forensic Services Unit Lab Quality Management System at a not to exceed amount of $15,000, terminating December 31st of 2020. Item C, adopt a resolution authorizing the chair to execute the release and settlement agreement between Praxair Distribution and the County of Berks in the amount of $1,200 regarding all claims in connection with a shortfall of supplemental oxygen bottles returned at the termination of the contract. Item D, adopt a resolution authorizing Brian Gottschall, director 
of the Department of Emergency Services to apply for the Radiation Emergency Response Fund grant for fiscal year 2020 through 2021 through the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency and is further authorized to execute the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania State Fiscal Year 2020 and 2021 Radiation Emergency Response Fund Grant Agreement and any and all documents required to complete the grant process. Item E, adopt a resolution ratifying, confirming and approving the chair on the behalf of the Board of Commissioners to execute a letter of support for a grant application to the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, Greenways, Trails and Recreation Program to conduct a feasibility study of the Reading to Hamburg Gap in the Schuylkill River Trail and further commit a cash contribution of $7,500 as a match for this grant. Item F, adopt a resolution authorizing the chair to execute the Child Welfare Education for Leadership Program Agreement between the County of Berks, Helen Marie A. Palumbo, an employee of Berks County Children and Youth Services and the University of Pittsburgh of the Commonwealth System of Higher Ed to participate in a graduate level social work program as outlined in Title 4B Part 1 of the Commonwealth's Child and Family Services Plan. Item G, adopt a resolution authorizing the chair to execute the Child Welfare Education for Leadership Program between the County of Berks, Marie Rossinoli, an employee of Berks County Children and Youth Services and the University of Pittsburgh of the Commonwealth System of Higher Ed to participate in a graduation level social work program as outlined in Title 4B, Part 1 of the Commonwealth's Child and Family Service Plan. Item H, adopt a resolution authorizing execution of the exclusive buyer-tenant agency agreement, commercial uh, between NAI Keystone Commercial and Industrial LLC, Steve Willems, and the County of Berks to provide professional services in determining whether the county should lease purchase, construct, construct, or use county property for the storage of the county's new election equipment and at, at an hourly rate of $200, not to exceed a fee of $10,000, subject to final review and approval by the county solicitor's office. Item I, adopt a resolution announcing the county will implement a reduction in workforce as a result of a reduced level of operations and curtailed personnel needs due to COVID-19. All county furloughs will end August 31st of 2020. It is further authorized <clears throat> that the Human Resources Department and the county solicitor's office work with, work with the impacted employees about their options and the Board of Commissioners approves the offering of a COVID severance package for qualifying employees. Item two, a motion authorizing execution of contract agreements, amendments as furnished by the contract coordinator as set forth on the attached listing dated July the 28th of 2020. There are a total of three contracts, one with information systems, one with library, the library system, and one with the treasurer's office. Item three, a motion to ratify and confirm payments set forth on the controller's office voucher listing dated July 28th of 2020 for the week ending July 28th of 2020 and the payment of electronic transfers and employee payroll. Motion to approve the agenda is presented. I will second the motion in the absence of Commissioner Rivera is there any discussion? Am I, Am I echoing? No, you sound fine. Thank you. Um, I, th I think we should probably uh, discuss briefly uh, the last item on the agenda. That is 263.2020. Uh, this has been reviewed uh, with department heads. I believe the raw, I know the raw officers are aware of this. The courts 
uh, are aware of this, and it has been uh, reviewed and accepted uh, by uh, the unions uh, that would be impacted. Um, I think it's important to note that the county has worked very transparently and carefully throughout the COVID-19 crisis, and we are not through this crisis by a long shot for the record. Uh, and early on when uh, we went into a limited capacity role with county government, a number of people in excess of 300 individuals were furloughed. Uh, initially, they kept their pay and benefits. Uh, at the end of, help me out here, Commissioner Barnhart, at, at what point did the pay end? That was April 14th, correct? Yeah, I think yeah, they I think received the check, check toward the end of April too. So we, right. we payroll was the middle of April and they received the check at the end of April. Right. And then from that point forward, individuals that were furloughed and the number consistently uh, dropped as individuals were brought back as needed. Uh, they had a choice of either taking unemployment or utilizing benefit time, vacation, uh, sick time, etc. We as a county uh, decided for those that were going on uh, unemployment that we would continue to pay for their health care which we continued to do and are doing through August 31st. Uh, the last that I checked, uh, we were just weak neck at 70 or fewer that were still out uh, on furlough. Is that correct? We had a list of 78 that uh, ultimately most of them came back. The list we're dealing with right now is a total of eight people, Christian. Yeah, eight yeah. that are still out. Yeah. No, that are part of the that are part of the layoff. The that are part of the layoff. That's yeah. correct. Uh, I believe yeah. Jess is meeting with some employees right now. This is Christine. Um, okay. you, you are correct that um, that list continues to be dwindled down. There are um, some. I, I can't give you an exact number because I know there were additional employees brought back by the courts this mm -hmm. week and are expected to be brought back next week as well. So that, that list is significantly less from where yes. it was. So this has been dealt with very, very carefully and the individuals uh, that uh, are losing their jobs are know that this is through no fault of their own. It happens to be that they are in departments where there just isn't work. Uh, they do have an opportunity uh, if there are other positions uh, to go for those, uh, but we worked to take care of these folks as, as best we possibly uh, could. I don't know if you wanna make any comments, Commissioner Barnhart. I would, we are, we are driven by taxpayers. Uh, overwhelmingly the amount of money that we take in to generate the services provided by the county or done by the taxpayers. I think we did an extremely credible job of supporting our employees who were put on a furlough, the nearly 300 people on a furlough. That was the row officers, the courts and the county. And as uh, business started to ramp back up, we brought a significant amount of people back into the building. We still have a fair amount of people working from home. And one of the comments was, do we save money by people working from home? Uh, we had to provide VPN service as well as laptops to many people, but there are still a, a significant number of people working from home because it's still a safer environment uh, for the social distancing and, and that sort of thing, where which can't be accomplished or accommodated in some of our tighter departments. But uh, yeah, the people that were on layoff, uh, I'm sorry, furloughed, were treated extremely well with benefits. Anyone who worked downtown was not obligated to pay for parking as they generally are. Uh, we are compassionate people, but at the same time, as we geared back up, uh, we're not fully operational yet. We, as Commissioner Leinbach pointed out, there are some services that are not being provided because of COVID-19 and there were some automation improvements done uh, that benefited our taxpayers and our offices. We have one in particular, the Register of Wills, 
pivoted and can literally do everything online. So that also helped not just with distance, distancing employees, having some of them working from home, but also limiting foot traffic from the public. Uh, we're still strongly encouraging visitors to have an appointment to sign in with the security guard and we're all trying to be safe here. So yes, this uh, issue on the agenda today impacts six, uh, eight people, six represented employees and two management confidential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. With that, we will move to our Berks County Treasurer, Dennis Adams, for the Treasurer's Report. Good morning. Good morning. We have an opening amount of $218,829,446.66. A balance to clear of $3,231,940.72. Leaving us with a balance today of $215,597,506.94. Thank you very much, Dennis. We'll move now to our county controller, Sandy Grafius, with the controller's report. Sandy. Oh, there she is. You're muted, Sandy. Sorry about that. I got back on just in time I was kicked off. Okay, here we go. Uh, total counts payable $3,635,169.46 and that's my total report. And I'm glad I made it in time for my name to be called. You, you did just fine. Uh, with that, we'll move to our Chief Administrative Officer, Ron Seaman for his report. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Nothing uh, really to report other than just a reminder that we are still not fully open. Most services are being offered by appointment only. We encourage people to contact the office of which you uh, need to deal with and schedule such appointment or take advantage of utilizing electronic uh, transmission of documents and so forth. That does not apply to emergency operations such as uh, applying for PFAs or uh, jury summonses or some other thing similar to that. But uh, if there's any questions, um, consult our webpage for information on who you should be contacting uh, and information on how to do that. Thank you very much, uh, Ron. We'll move now to Commissioner Kevin Barnhart for Commissioner's Reports. Thank you, Commissioner Leinbach and everyone who has joined us today. I have a few uh, items of note for the public and for my colleagues and staff as well. A uh, contact tracing update as of Wednesday, there are still six functioning contact tracing teams in place. Of those six staff, three are bicultural and bilingual. Uh, we are, they are cutting off hiring part-time staff for now. All others are cleared and on a waiting list and they expect to bring two or three more on in the coming weeks. Volunteer help has been outstanding. To date, 483 contacts are in the database. 40 have refused contact tracing at a low of 8%. Please note that some of the recent refusals have been because by the time we received the information, due to test result delays, contacts were already near or at the end of what would have been their quarantine period. Uh, the 483 contacts currently in the database represent 136 new contacts in the past week or about a 39% increase in the past week. And talking to Carolyn Basic the other day, uh, Quest is down about eight days. I think a few weeks ago was out 10, 12 days. They're back down to eight days, but still isn't a quick enough turnaround. Uh, the, uh, the delays mean they're reaching contacts later in the process. And uh, what they've determined lately, uh, some of the larger exposures, lacrosse team, a small daycare center, several first fast food restaurant workers and a kindergarten, kindergarten teacher. So kind of runs the gamut of uh, the contact tracing being being done. Uh, there was a virtual town hall for any school district of parents on July 28th, moderated by Mary Jo Allman, along with Dr. Karen Wang and other health care professionals. 
They address mainly COVID-19 questions from a list of commonly asked questions and provided resources for parents. The session was translated into Spanish so that it would be available in both languages and will be posted to the school's website. A note of caution, Carolyn expects to be more of a community increase uh, active in return to school and sports that we see more positive case and the opportunity for large scale exposures will exist. Keep that in mind, everyone. Uh, moving on to our community needs assessment. Uh, we extended the deadline till tomorrow. Uh, we opened this up the end of June, June 28th. It's been almost a month that we've been trying to cultivate the needs of the community uh, regarding our allocation of $38 million of CARES Act money. So far, we've received 141 assessments, uh, municipal public authority 20, public health services 10, not-for-profit not for social services 40, educational services eight, and business and other service providers 63. So you still have time to apply. It's on the county website. It's on our homepage, countyberks.com under community needs assessment. If for some reason you find out today and can't make the deadline tomorrow, just give us an email. There's an email on there, uh, community needs at countyberks.com or email the commissioners. Uh, we'll certainly put you in because starting tomorrow, we're going to start to cultivate through these assessments with Whit O'Brien and to de determine the next step and who gets an application for money and which individuals or groups we need to get more information from. And I've said this repeatedly, I'll say it again. Given the cost factor of the county so far, Tower Health and the helping harvest needs from March till the end of the year, we would be out of $38 million, just those three organizations. The county's money that we've spent and will spend on PPE and protective services, the needs of the food bank and the needs of Reading Health System, not Tower Health, but just a component in uh, Reading and Berks County, that's $38 million. So that's why, again, we want to impress upon our federal legislators that this money is not nearly enough to cover the critical needs of Berks County. Uh, just want to remind everyone that BARDA has completely installed all of the protective devices in the buses and we'll start charging fares again come Monday. So be be aware of that you'll be entering the bus again in the front and exiting from the rear to the rear. Uh, that was several months that uh, we were not charging fares just to try to keep things as safe as possible. Moving to Mount Penn Preserve, we had a very productive meeting last Wednesday and uh, we are working on two components right now, a DCNR application for a trails master plan for Mount Penn Preserve. We all know there's probably too many trails, 45 miles worth of trails uh, on the Mount Penn Preserve. Some we need to uh, cut off and no longer use. A lot of them have been blazed by people illegally and we wanna really get a master plan and really hone in on that. Additionally, our uh, Preservation and Land Use Committee, Matthew Brophy, a shout out to him. He has proposed a Pagoda Trail, which will lead from the Double Tree, wind through City Park and up to the Pagoda and back around. Uh, it's very picturesque. It really it captures a lot of the essence of the great things on Mount Penn as well as in City Park proper. It's only a two mile walk and it's already on existing trails. So the Mount Penn Preserve allocated $3,000 uh, from the contributions we received from the municipalities in the county uh, to properly sign uh, this endeavor. So uh, people that want to come downtown, stay at the hotel or even just come downtown and take a nice uh, two mile walk to see the beauty that this area has to offer. It's in the pipeline. Last but not least, everyone is concerned with elections. Uh, we have an election board meeting at 11 o'clock, which is published here on MS Teams. Some critical issues, we're gonna be discussing continuing need for PPE for November, uh, potential pay for the poll workers, a security uh, secure lockbox for the lobby of the services center, and uh, the two uh, city charter questions, whether uh, staff and the managing director uh, should live in the city or not live in the city. So I just wanna make sure that everyone's really pepped up about the election, uh, so if you uh, want to tune in MS Teams at 11 o'clock or soon after that, uh, we're going to be working through that process at 11 a.m. That's what I have as far as my report. So if I have any comments in the end, I respectfully request that I have the opportunity to do that at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Barnhart. Uh, I have several items. 
I am going to begin by uh, sharing the Pennsylvania Department of Health COVID-19 early warning uh, dashboard. Uh, this is updated on a weekly basis. Uh, internally, we also are chat tracking uh, much of the same data, but uh, the numbers on confirmed cases, this is, I'm gonna show you Pennsylvania, uh, this is Pennsylvania, and then I'll show you Berks County. Newly reported cases, we're looking at 14 days, the first seven, the most recent. And so it's an up hour arrow again, because the total cases are going up. Uh, incident rate per 100,000 is also going up uh, over the last seven days. Uh, the positivity rate is also going up. And again, that the, all the people that are tested, if you just have um, a, a lot more people being tested, and as a result, there are more cases, but the positivity rate stays the same or even goes lower, that's not a problem. But the positivity rate continues to climb. The average daily COVID-19 specific hospitalizations, last seven days, uh, that has uh, gone up. Uh, ventilators for the last seven days, not dramatic increase, but an increase nonetheless. Uh, the only area where there's a decline, and it's a slight decline, uh, is ER visits due to COVID-like illnesses. Um, real quickly, looking at uh, Berks County. We'll pull that up, it'll take a moment uh, for that uh, process. And here we are, uh, confirmed cases are up over the most recent seven days. Cases per 100,000 residents is up pretty significantly over the last seven days. Our positivity rate, although it's just under the state seven day average, which is 4.7, we're at 4.6. Good news is there's a slight decrease on hospitalizations. Uh, we remain zero on the ventilators and there is an increase in emergency department visits due to COVID-19. I wanna also uh, share some additional information. Uh, I sit on the County Commissioners Association statewide task force uh, that communicates with the governor's office and the Department of Health each Monday and each Friday. And uh, I believe uh, every other week we have a call with the governor, uh, which took place uh, this past Friday. Uh, two things that I have been very engaged in. One, uh, shortly after the governor announced that Lebanon County was the only county that would not receive CARES Act money, any CARES Act money. Uh, I contacted our CCAP board of directors and challenged them that I felt we needed to take a stand and uh, reach out to the governor and let him know that every county should receive all of their CARES money, uh, that there should be nothing political or partisan about that. Uh, last Wednesday, we had a virtual CCAP board meeting. Our board unanimously agreed uh, to take that action. That letter was emailed to the governor on Thursday. Uh, we brought it up in the discussion with the governor, the governor on Friday. The governor said he had not seen the letter, uh, but that he would take a look at it. Also on Friday, I was one of two commissioners that was asked to address the governor on the uh, change in restaurant and bar rules. Uh, I think everyone's aware that uh, bars with a physical bar, uh, they're not allowed to serve anyone at the bar, but the bigger issue was inside dining was uh, dropped from 50% capacity to 25% capacity. For approximately two and a half weeks, almost three now, since that was announced, CCAP has been asking the Department of Health and the governor's office for the data to explain to us why uh, restaurants and bars uh, were selected. Was there data showing uh, that there was a real issue 
or was it something else? Uh, we've been unable to get any clear data, or any data on restaurants and bars. And so Friday, when I spoke to the governor, and I will assure you, I spoke respectfully, but I shared with the governor that in my previous life uh, in advertising, we had a saying, and it goes like this, in God we trust, all others bring data. And I said, Governor, where is the data that shows that restaurants and bars are leading to the increased cases, the increased hospitalization, increased positivity rate? And initially, uh, he couldn't give us anything. Then he said, well, I think there is data, but I'm not sure we can share that because of privacy laws. Uh, we asked the governor to look at that and explain to him uh, that we're dealing with small businesses. And I'm not gonna tell you I don't care about the chain restaurants. Uh, I care about business in general, but I'm particularly concerned about individuals that have one or two restaurants. I've talked uh, to owners of our local restaurants that at 50%, they thought they are able to break even. Uh, last week, I talked to uh, Joe, I believe it's Nemec. He owns uh, Johnny and Hans. He has two locations, one in Muhlenberg, one out in Robazonia. And he let me know he was closing his Muhlenberg location because at 25%, he's losing money. Uh, we have not received an answer. Uh, we were told that uh, they would get back to us and uh, tell us what the basis is, if they're able to. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm just sharing that with you so you understand that this is a frustrating process. The other commissioner that shared was Eric Coolidge from Tioga County, and he has worked with the Northern Tier Counties, and uh, those restaurant owners have come to them and said, where, we don't understand where the crisis is. Tioga County shared with the governor on Friday that since the beginning of the COVID crisis, They've had a total of 33 positive uh, COVID-19 cases, and they currently have three active cases. And ask the governor, how can you justify closing, uh, not closing, but dropping the capacity in our region? So this is going to continue. We will be discussing this again tomorrow uh, with representatives from the Department of Health and uh, from the governor's office. One other note, uh, going back to uh, something that Commissioner uh, Barnhart had stated, it's important to note that we are the eighth largest county by population in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. In the CARES Act legislation passed by the federal government, any county with 500,000 people or more received a direct allocation of their CARES money. Lancaster County to our south uh, received $95 million, roughly the middle of April. We received $38 million, roughly, I think Commissioner Barnard three weeks ago. July 13th. Uh, yeah, July 13th. <clears throat> if we had received per capita what uh, Lancaster had received, we should have received $75 million. Uh, we were concerned that that's what was going to happen. That's why NACO, the National Association of Counties, on the CARES Act, lobbied the administration, lobbied uh, leaders in the House and the Senate that CARES Act money, duly authorized to go to county and local governments, should have all gone directly to those uh, governments, that if it went to states, states were going to take money off the top, states were gonna play games like what we see happening with Lebanon County, where that money's being withheld because of a political uh, dispute between county commissioners and uh, a governor. And fortunately, that is what has happened. And it's put Berks County in a much more difficult position than I believe the federal government initially uh, intended. But again, when you feed things through uh, states, and this is not just Pennsylvania, 
This is not just aimed at Governor Wolf. This is happening in Republican and Democratic controlled uh, state houses and governor's offices uh, across uh, the country. The last thing I wanna touch on is once again, uh, there's been a discussion about uh, commissioners meetings, uh, transparency, uh, a answering of questions. And I read the Reading Eagle article. Uh, I wasn't particularly happy with it uh, because I don't believe it covered uh, the truth of the situation appropriately. So let me uh, take a few moments to do that. Up until this year, the rule for many, many years was public comment. The commissioners as a rule rarely said anything. And we explain it's always been public comment. The law doesn't require a Q&A. The law requires that a period in the weekly commissioners meeting or regular commissioners meeting uh, be allowed for public comment. So we have done that. But all of that public comment was done in person. There was no virtual comment option. So for many years, we broadcast uh, the weekly commissioners meeting over BCTV. And if people wanted to comment, they had to drive to downtown Reading, in most cases, pay to park, uh, take the elevator to the 13th floor and appear in person. When COVID-19 hit and we realized we were going to need to do virtual uh, commissioners meetings and any public meeting was going to become virtual, we went to our IS department. Uh, they provided the Microsoft Teams platform we're specifically in the live event platform of Microsoft Teams. And when we did that, uh, we immediately had more participation because people could participate online. Uh, Commissioner Barnhart can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we would have um, anywhere from no one to three, maybe four people on average uh, speak at a commissioner's meeting. Since we've been on the Microsoft Teams platform, uh, we've seen anywhere from 15 to 25, 26 uh, comments, and I haven't looked recently. I don't know how many uh, comments there are already. But not only are we on Microsoft Teams, we began weeks ago broadcasting simultaneously to Facebook Live and to YouTube Live. Uh, and in fact, I just see right now we have 17 attendees on Facebook, three on YouTube and 25 attendees in micro Microsoft Teams Live. Uh, we have opened up access. I would also add another thing that with the newer, new board of commissioners, even before we came into the virtual setting, there was a lot more interaction on the comment section uh, trying to answer uh, questions that haven't been answered uh, before or an questions to which we knew uh, the answers or related uh, to county government. But more importantly, we now have put every single public facing meeting on Microsoft Teams live event. And let me make it clear, this does cost time and money. We have anywhere from five to seven of our IS department staff producing this program. They're the ones that are watching Facebook comments, YouTube comments, and posting them up into the uh, Microsoft Teams so Mary Buer can share those comments uh, from the public. They're the ones that make sure the camera is on the right person. And uh, if we're not doing things right, they often are sending us notes to let us know we need to turn our camera on or, or, or whatever else is taking place. Additionally, in June, we made a uh, determination and have publicized this multiple times, but for some reason, many people are not aware that when we do come back to in-face meetings, we are committed 
to continuing the Microsoft Teams live event, the Facebook Live, and the YouTube Live for our commissioner meetings. So for the record, consider that one public meeting a week was on television, but there was no ability to interact uh, virtually with that meeting. That's the way it used to be. Today, every single public meeting is available on Microsoft Teams Live for the public to participate from their home, from their office, wherever they might be. That is all about providing greater transparency, greater access than ever before. And frankly, I'm proud of our county. I'm proud of our IS uh, team and my colleagues. I can tell you when we discuss, should we continue this even after virtual? And Commissioner Barnhart, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there was any suggestion that we do anything else except keep this tool out for the public. So I, I wanted to go on record so that people understand that in spite of some of the comments that have been made about a lack of transparency and unwillingness to address uh, legitimate questions, I strongly disagree. I think we've done a great job. I think my colleagues have done a great job as well. With that, Mary, we're going to move to uh, comments. Uh, can you uh, take us through the public comments? We're going to begin with Tammy Keener, Spring Township. If schools don't open, funding should go to the parents. CDC director states that it is a higher risk to our children of suicide and drug addiction if they don't return to school than the risk of getting COVID. Why don't you as governor why don't you as commissioners push the governor to give the choice to parents on where they have their children go to school? The kids must return to school. Citizens have paid in property taxes and they should get a refund since the teachers haven't taught. John Miller, Sinking Spring. Commissioners, can you tell us if the county has realized any financial savings from employees working from home? Will this continue to be an option after COVID? Sam Brinkadora, Burn Township. Good morning, commissioners. I want to express my support for local law enforcement and ask you to consider increasing funding. I believe other than the Sheriff's Department, the county has limited financial input in other law enforcement jurisdictions. However, I'm asking you to use your influence to encourage all areas to support and increase funding. We here defund the police or redir redirect funds. They both mean the same, less money for law enforcement. I don't think that crime is under control in Berks County to the extent that would allow us to cut back. Crime would certainly increase and the safety of our citizens would be put in harm's way. I'm sure criminals would love cutbacks to occur. I would like to see more funding for the police. I would like to see more police officers on the streets, walking the beat, getting to know the people on their beat, developing a bond, a trust with the people. This is how it was when I was growing up. Physical street presence would decrease crime, increase cooperation, and make our neighborhoods safer. We need to get back to where the police and citizens are on the same team against the bad guys. Switching gears slightly, we should remember that the police have one of the most stressful, stressful jobs and one of the most likely to be killed on the job. Also, they must make life and death decisions in a fraction of a second. Any call, no matter how innocent it may seem, could result in death. I'm sure the police officer's heart is pounding every time an officer approaches a driver of a stopped vehicle, as well as other situations. 
they want to go home to their families as well. Following police instructions is the surest way that no harm will come to anyone. Please commissioners, more funding, not less. Thank you for your time. Jess Royer. We did that one. We did that one. Liz Cates, Burn Township. Commissioner Barnhart, do you have an update on your negotiations with the Commonwealth regarding the repurposing of the Burks Family Detention Center? Chris, Christopher Ellis, Redding. President Donald Trump just stated that November's election will be the most fraudulent in history due to mail-in balloting and asked if our country should delay the presidential election. Will all three of you affirm that you will conduct our election as is and will you affirm that mail-in voting is not fraudulent since Berks County runs its own election services? Jess, and we did already do this one as well. Yes. Jordan Henning, Exeter. Given that one of the problems of criminal police misconduct is the hesitancy to hurt the rapport between the DA's office and the police, are there any discussions to develop a position for an independent special counsel for the handling of any criminal police misconduct complaints. What is the county doing to implement proven community-based policing strategies to try and reduce the animosity between the residents and the police force? Bree Tyson, Redding. The asylum seekers in the detention center are here because they fled from violence, traveled thousands of miles, crossed open ocean and international borders and are now incarcerated during a global pandemic. When will Berks County terminate the contract with ICE? Betty Schmoyer from Heidelberg Township. Hello, commissioners. I have seen and appreciated how well cared for the residents at Berksheim are. Their needs and quality of life are of utmost importance. It's time we thought of the detainees at the detention center the same way, focusing on what they need and how to help ensure their own safety and well-being. Holding them captive, especially in the midst of a pandemic, is not at all in their best interest. And to make these families choose to be separated from their children is a crime in itself. No parent should ever have to make that choice. We are supposed to be a people of love and compassion, what have we turned into? Thank you. Christopher Smith, Albany Township. Do you have any control over our public schools? If so, what is being done to ensure that K through 12 grades reopen this fall? Jess Royer, Spring Township. As schools are considering whether or not to reopen fully, partially, or somewhere in between, I would encourage the county to bolster its support of libraries and home internet access. A well-publicized study found that almost 20% of Berks County residents do not have reliable internet service at home. Berks County libraries can play a crucial role in helping to bridge that gap, especially at a time when that connectivity is more important than ever, and yet previously dependable sources of in income may in fact not be secure. As part of helping county residents deal with this pandemic, assistance could be made available directly to these residents who do not have internet access at home due to income levels. Similarly, similarly, a county health department is an important part of a comprehensive pandemic response and would ensure more accurate data supporting reporting and contact tracing. There is no better use of government resources than to support those in our community who need it. Thank you for your time. Adrian Jadick, why I'm missing. Our awareness of the spread, virility, and mortality of COVID-19 would be more fully developed into the establishment 
with the establishment of a county health department. Such a health department would also help with contact tracing, which is a crucial part of the response to this sort of situation. How will this be accomplished without a fully functioning health department that can stay abreast of new developments and subsequent waves of infections after private partners move on to other projects? I believe we read this. Which one, the Jess Royer one? Yes. Yes, he did. He just, he wanted to make sure it got in. That's fine. Okay. Crystal Kowalski, why I'm missing. Good morning, commissioners. I am happy to see in your operation meeting minutes that you are considering holding town hall meetings. I believe a town hall formatted to provide a back and forth exchange between the public and county officials could go a long way toward addressing some entrenched problems. Brainstorming collaborative solutions and hearing from impacted communities can bring about real and meaningful change. I propose that the first series of town halls address issues within Berks County's criminal justice system. Thank you, Crystal Kowalski. Susan Hefner, Lower Heidelberg. Meetings to continue on Microsoft Live is great. I ask the commissioners to take the next step and make the meetings in the evening once we are in a new normal. Our township meetings are in the evening and that gives more of the public a chance to watch live and ask questions. Okay, that concludes the Q&A. Okay, uh, we will uh, close uh, the Q&A, well, not Q&A, the comment uh, segment. Uh, Commissioner Barnhart, uh, do you want to make any comments? Sure, I will respond to the questions I can answer. Uh, so first of all, we talked about the work from home really isn't a cost savings as much as it's a safety factor. And yes, we still continue to have a fair number of people working from home and they will continue to do so. Uh, when it comes to funding of law enforcement, the county I would dare say has a significant contribution to law enforcement with the jail, uh, the sheriff's department, central booking for an entire county. The district attorney's office does prosecutions also has a detective force, forensic unit at our agricultural center, and we also sponsor the BSERT team, the emergency response team. Uh, the courts, adult probation and juvenile probation, and also the 911 system. So all told, that's probably in excess of 70 to $80 million in support of law enforcement. Uh, BCRC question, still waiting for the call from Governor Wolf's office. Uh, my phone's here on my desk. So when he calls, I'll be happy to take his call. Election services, Christopher Ellis, absolutely. Uh, it's a hallmark of counties. We run elections. The 3,000 some counties in the United States run elections. And I too find it uh, disheartening that there is this uh, information out there that mail-in ballots or absentee ballots are subject to fraud. So I was very upset last night when I got home and I got franked. Everybody knows what franking privilege is from Dan Muser, this huge mailer from Congressman Dan Muser. Of course, he's running for re-election, so he gets to do this for free. And one of his hallmarks is uh, opposed to mail-in voting measures that would open the door to fraud. So of course I'm responding to him. It must be nice to use Frankie to promote your campaign without using your own money. Taxpayer funded campaign. Get off the fake news that mail-in ballots are subject to fraud. And PS, oh, I also don't need a stamp to mail this back to you. And it says, would you like to receive mail updates? I said, absolutely not. So it's interesting in, in the times of elections where you get this, taxpayers paid for this, telling us that uh, mail-in ballots are, are fake and a fraud and can't be trusted. I think that's just disgusting. Mm -hmm. uh, control of public schools, we don't. We have a working relationship with BCIU and we've had numerous online calls with them. 
about school openings or what they plan to do, but really that's the province of the school districts. And from what I've been reading in all news accounts in the newspaper and whatever I can get my hands on, uh, they're struggling with this. Uh, but it's really up to the individual school districts from what I understand with guidance from the state. Uh, the question about internet access, we did get a guesstimate of what it would take to provide air cards uh, to the students that are in the county uh, who do not have proper internet access. Uh, that is probably about $12 million for one year. So we could utilize, again, that $38 million, that's not enough for air cards for students to use at home, but then we'd have to find a funding source going into the next year and the year after the year after of $12 million for air cards. And uh, I'm not gonna talk again about the uh, constant wrangling about should we have a county health department, why, how, and when. Uh, I would just look to the data from, again, the counties in the Commonwealth, there's six of them that have a county health department, look at their numbers, look at that information. Uh, I think there's some value to a discussion about a public health department, but I would remind everybody uh, that there is a far reaching expectation when you implement a county health department to the point where when you have a bake sale at your local library, the health officer will come back and make sure that you listed the ingredients on the cupcakes you're selling at the library. So just keep these things in mind. When you wanna talk about a health department, it has far reaching implications, not just for the overall public health, but it can certainly reach into people's lives when otherwise have been perfectly fine without one. So I hope I answered the questions. Uh, and again, I'm gonna uh, defer any other comments to Commissioner Leinbach. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Barnhart. Um, I'm gonna address a number of items and I think I'll start where uh, Commissioner Barnhart uh, ended. Uh, I agree completely with his comments on a county health department, but let me uh, address some other aspects. Right now, Bucks County's health department, and we learned this through our re fairly regular communication with our Brooks County Intermediate Unit and Dr. Jill Hackman. The Bucks County Department of Health is telling the school districts well, on social distancing and returning to school, you really can't do that. So don't worry about that. And mask, masks are optional. Uh, I would ask you, uh, how does that align with what the Pennsylvania Department of Health has said? Not saying one's right, one's wrong, but do not assume that just because you have a Department of Health that they are going to do things as you think they necessarily should. Uh, the question also specifically mentioned that contact tracing will be much better. I strongly disagree with that. Right now, Lancaster County and Berks County are in separate contracts uh, with local providers. I believe uh, Commissioner Barnhart Lancaster is through uh, Lancaster General Hospital and uh, we're through Co-County Wellness. Uh, I feel a lot better about that contact tracing because I know exactly what is happening and what is not happening. I know that our people are not being electronically traced. I know that our system is voluntary and Commissioner Barnhart does a great job each week sharing the number of people that have declined uh, to participate because it, it's, it's their right as an American citizen. So I would argue we have very good contact tracing. Counties, most counties uh, rely on the Department of Health uh, in Harrisburg to do their contact tracing. Uh, I know Commissioner Barnhart addressed this. I'll simply say, as he did, we have no authority to tell schools whether they should open or close. However, we have been on several uh, virtual calls with uh, the Berks County Intermediate Union, Unit and superintendents discussing different aspects of what they're dealing with, what we're dealing with. Uh, we really appreciate Brian Gottschall, our director of the Department of Emergency Services for participating uh, on those as well. He's the guy with a lot of uh, details. Evening meetings keep coming up 
and they keep referencing school boards and municipalities and boroughs. Folks, there's a reason they do their meetings in the evening, and that is most of those people work during the day. We work during the day. If you look right now, there are probably, and I'm guessing uh, our IS folks will know, but six or seven of our IS staff necessary to run this program. All of those people are going to be asked to work in the evening. We're, we're not doing that. We are making this program more available than it's ever been before. I might add that when we post on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, that becomes a permanent record. Anybody can look back uh, at a meeting very easily by going to the county's Facebook page, going to the YouTube site. And in addition, BCTV records these meetings and keeps it on their archives and on their uh, YouTube page. <coughs> As far as funding for law enforcement, uh, I would encourage uh, anyone uh, that wants to know what we do. Commissioner Barnhart did a great job delineating all the different areas. No, we don't fund or control local police departments. We don't uh, fund or control state police or constables. But those areas that we are involved in, I encourage you to talk to our sheriff, talk to our district attorney, no, we don't give them everything they ever ask for, but they will be the first ones to tell you that we have a great relationship, that we work together and we do and they do what is necessary to protect all of the people in our community. As far as working from home, there is one long-term possibility when we talk about savings. Uh, in our phase three uh, meetings, uh, primarily Commissioner Rivera uh, took about half of the county uh, departments and row officers, I took half. <clears throat> We've had several departments that believe there's the potential for a, a, a need of less office space. Uh, our budget department almost has been uh, virtual the entire time. Uh, a handful of people, and I think there might be three or so uh, that do come in every day, come in because uh, the environment here is more conducive uh, than working uh, from home. And I understand that. I do the same thing. It's easier for me uh, to work here in downtown Reading than it is for me uh, to be in my home. But the potential exists that we may not need all the office space. How real is that? Uh, this past week, I had a discussion with a couple of different people about one of the economic impacts long-term of COVID-19. And it revolves around people understanding the value of virtual meetings. I would not want to be the owner of office space right now that I'm counting on leasing out because a lot of businesses are finding they can do a lot and in many cases even be more efficient by acting virtually. Let me give you another example that's happening right now in Berks County. The courts, and this is through the president judge, I talk, try to talk to him once a week, we do that virtually. But he's shared, uh, the, uh, our district attorney has had this discussion, our public defender and our warden, that we have seen a dramatic increase of the use of virtual technology in hearings. And here's what it means in moving uh, inmates back and forth from the jail. Historically, all day, the um, sheriff's office is transporting uh, inmates from the jail to the county and back. And that process is fairly extensive. They have to go through the security exiting the jail, get in a vehicle, drive over. There's a cost of time, uh, money, uh, and also 
the use of gasoline back and forth. They come over, they have to uh, be checked in, and then they wait in a holding area till the judge is ready. Sometimes that can be anywhere from an hour to two hours or more. In many of those cases, we're being told that that one, two, three hours has turned into 10 or 15 minutes because they're able to do that at the jail. And it has been so significant that we are actually enhancing the uh, virtual uh, conferencing capabilities between the jail and the county. The last thing uh, that I'll touch on is the elections reform and mail-in ballots. Uh, let me be clear, the way Berks County handles mail-in ballots, I believe is appropriate and secure. Not every county handles mail-in ballots the same way. And that is one of the things that became apparent as a result of the Trump administration's litigation here in Pennsylvania. Just one example is I've been involved on several calls with the County Commissioners Association and was fairly surprised to hear that there were some other counties that had remote ballot drop boxes that were not secure. And by secu not secure, they were in a building with no type of security uh, personnel. Our mail drop box, the only one we had was inside the county services center in uh, visual distance, actually within walking uh, probably 20 feet from our security and uh, sheriff's uh, staff. So our, our remote drop box is effective and is the right way to do it. So there are some things that we would like to see the courts delineate so that we know exactly what the rules are going into the general election. I will tell you that the concern is, and uh, Commissioner Barnhart, I know we're walking in for overtime for the elections board meeting, but you might wanna touch on this. There are several areas that are unclear right now relative to elections that our hope was the courts would give clear direction I'm not sure that that's gonna happen, uh, but that would be beneficial. And it's a result really of the Act 77 that was passed last year. And then I can't remember what the act, name of the act. I think it's Act 24. Mm -hmm. So can you touch on that briefly? And then we'll, I know we have to get to the election board. Well, what we're dealing with now is the competing lawsuits between the Trump uh, campaign and the Pennsylvania Democrats and we, we've asked for an expedited review of those claims so we know exactly as Berks County and other counties, at least in the Commonwealth, know how to direct and conduct our elections going into the fall. What, it, what is typical of the courts is they're gonna wait till the very last minute. It's gonna be mm -hmm. a real nightmare trying to, maybe if we have to integrate any of these changes or anything else, but by and large, the. Uh, I'm not taking sides in this, but I think the allegations asserted by the Trump campaign and Trump uh, is about the uh, harvesting of ballots, which no one in Berks County did. That means driving by and picking up uh, ballots from people and these remote boxes that were not secured. Uh, we did not do that here in the county. We did not have unsecured boxes, nor did we do any kind of harvesting uh, of votes. So I think we're pretty safe from that aspect, but. Uh, there are also provisions to, you know, to process the ballots quicker, earlier before the election. Uh, so here again, uh, our directions, elections director, Debbie Oliveri, needs 10 people to augment her staff between now and November 3rd uh, to get this work done. It's only 50, uh, 97 days, 96 days before the election. Mm -hmm. 50 days prior, people started getting, getting their mail-in uh, mail-in ballots. If you applied for one in the primary, you'll get one uh, going into the fall 50 days out. So there's a lot of work. Uh, I would say this is like planning for a wedding or uh, Christmas is all the build up to the election day. Uh, there's so much planning and, and work that has to be done ahead of time. So we're hoping there's a expedited review of these lawsuits and that it's there's clear direction for the counties 
exactly what we can and can't do. So again, integrity of elections is very, very uh, important uh, to our democracy and guaranteed from this from this vantage point, we're not gonna let anything slip through. So thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Barnhart. I did note on the internal chat feature, I skipped over row officer comments. I put a note out uh, to our uh, folks on from the row officers. I heard from JD that he has our, a prothonotary has uh, no comments, but I apologize. I'll try not to do that again. Um, so with that, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn and we'll jump right over to elections? So moved. The, mo uh, the motion's been made and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. I couldn't really have one.